Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you um, for the invitation to you, Nicholas and uh, Helawa. Well, um, I first came into contact with Blumenbach through Stephen Jay Gould. I was a fan of Stephen Jay Gould and read his Mismeasure of Man, second edition, and I used this in a seminar, and there um, Gould uh, demonstrated that uh, Blumenbach um, had promoted racism and slavery by designing a hierarchical racial geometry. And um, in the course of his argument, he brings this um, illustration you have seen from Bob Richards already, where he claims this is from the anthropological treatises by Blumenbach. And then I sent students to look for the illustration, and they couldn't find it. And, and so I um, wondered uh, where this illustration came from. And it turned out that um, Blumenbach um, or the publisher, as he claimed later, um, fabricated it. It's actually easily seen because you see the, 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 the type of, of the letters are the same as here. So it's very obvious. Anyway, in this uh, short controversy I had with, uh, with Gould, he then claimed, well, the, the, the illustration may be um, not uh, from the original, but his argument still <laughs> Is, um, is right, and, and I, my feeling was that Gould actually misrepresented and misunderstands Blumenbach's intentions and results. And now I want to discuss if this is right or not. What were Blumenbach's intentions and results? And to find out, I think you have to go back, of course, to his book. This is the book uh, Blu uh, Gould uh, refers to um, in the English translation on the natural variety of mankind, the third edition. The book actually has four sections. The last section treats the uh, question of the varieties of mankind. It's 12 out of 131 pages, so it's a very minor part of the whole book. And um, it's not uh, basically something like a summary or conclusion, but it's one part, it's one section and the other sections are important as well. So what is uh, uh, Blumenbach actually talking about? The first p section is on the difference between uh, man and other animals. We have heard this from um, Bob Richards as well. This was a big question. Then on the causes and ways by which animals degenerate, degenerate in a neutral um, understanding means um, change um, universally. And then on the causes and ways in which mankind have degenerated in particular. So it's a, I would say, a long argument that uh, Blumenbach presents here and his uh, sort of uh, racial distinction varieties is just one minor part in the whole um, argument. Blumenbach clearly says what his, the, the uh, primary object of the whole treatise is. Uh, a uh, quote here from his book, Paragraph 22. Um, we come to the primary object of the whole treatise. We will inquire of what kind and how great is the natural diversity which separates the races and nations of man, and to consider if the origin of this diversity can be traced back to degeneration within a species or if there are more than one original species of man. This is basically his question. Um, that he wants to answer in his book. So, are, there, are the populations, the ge geographical um, populations of mankind, do they belong to one species? Are there varieties or different species? Here, by, um, for example, um, interestingly, the uh, illustrations from the third uh, German um, edition. Um, just um, if you have a look at them, I will come back to them later. So, this of course was um, a scientific question. We heard this from Renato already. Uh, first of all, Blumenbach wants to clean up the mess um, Linnaeus has um, um, made up in, in his Systema Naturae. Um, Linnaeus has two, actually two species, the, the Homo sapiens and the, the caveman, Homo troglodytes. And he has a lot of varieties, for example, the, as we have heard from Renato, the, the albino here, and then you have orang-utan, 
And here in the uh, varieties of Homo sapiens, you have Homo feros. You see here Homo feros. This is like the wild Peter, wolf's, Wolfskinder, and um, you have Monstrosus, whatever this is. So this is a real mess. And Bloomberg's um, intention is to clean this up and sort of uh, put it into a scientific, um, um, on a scientific basis. And of course, there is the political question of the whole thing. This is monogenism, polygenism. And there is, interestingly, in the uh, two sort of aspects. The first, we have not heard about that, is creationism and biblical literalism. Um, he um, claims, in the, uh, this is by Gruber, he says um, polygenists um, or uh, some enlightenment uh, um, philosophers like uh, Voltaire uh, criticized the monogenic view because it was too close to uh, the biblical tradition. They thought um, this would give uh, credibility the, to the Bible, and so they criticized monogenism from this perspective. Yeah. And, of course, there was the question of slavery, and you see here from the preface from uh, Johann Gottfried Gruber, um, Blumenbach, sort of the intention of the book is to wake up the slave traders from their slumber various scholars who try to defend the unity of mankind among us, Hofrat Blumenbach came forward. You wonder why Thomas Jefferson would be here. Um, I put him here, he was not a slave trader, of course, but he was a slave owner, and um, while uh, Gould says Blumenbach was sort of promoting racism, he says Jefferson was promoting anti-racism, and I find this a little <laughs> strange. Somebody who is a slave owner was sort of the positive figure to, um, uh, to depict anti-racism. Anyway, I'm a great fan of Thomas Jefferson, but I thought I should not uh, get over that without mentioning. Well, Blumen was long, one long argument, you could say. He was convinced that if you could scientifically prove that mankind is a single species, that would be better than just a moral appeal if you want to fight slavery. Huh? So this was, on the other hand, not undisputed. I will just, uh, just give you one example. <coughs> Georg Forster, we have heard of him. He was a polygenist, and he said, well, the common origin did not prevent degenerated Europeans from ruling over their fellow white men as despotically as they rule over Negroes. So Georg Forster was not convinced that this argument would actually um, help much, but um, Anyway, um, Blumenbach thought it would at least bring some uh, advantages. So his problem, of course, was how to actually prove scientifically that there's only one species. That, of course, hinges on the question, what is a species? What actually is a species? And the, um, the common definition at that time from Linnaeus or the Buffon was the common origin. So a species is everything that is, descends from one pair, if you want, uh, one prototype, um, as uh, it's called by uh, Buffon. And the first animal, the first horse, was the exterior model, the interior mold on which all horses are born and so on. So you have a common origin. You have to prove the common origin. This was sort of undisputed, and Blumenbach was convinced that it's right. But now, he says, we come to the real difficulty. How? Um, which is to set forth the characters by which, in the natural world, we may distinguish between mere, mere varieties and genuine species. How can we actually tell? I mean, this is a nice definition, but how can we tell? And there he has two criteria. The first one we have heard, this is one that Kant uses. He said we use Buffon's rule. If two animals generate between fertile youth, then we call them one species. And since humans do that, we just call them, according to this definition, all belong to the same um, natural genus, that is species. Very easy, so we can settle the case. But why would now Blumenbach write a big book of 200 pages if the question is so easily to answer? Because he can say, he is uh, completely at the core with, uh, with um, Kant and, and Buffon, but he said, how, how can we prove this? It's not feasible. First thing, 
um, with domesticated animals because of the difference of, of, of environment, there could be changes that ch sort of disturb the natural uh, situation. And humans are a do domesticated animal for Blumenbach. And the uh, second thing is we have to bring all these wild animals to a test of copulation. We have to prove it empirically. We have to make tests of copulation experimental proof if you want so. Now, if you go to humans, this test of copulation has to be applied first to the ge geographical populations of mankind. And then, of course, to humans and apes. Otherwise, we wouldn't know they are different species if we don't have uh, first do this test of copulations with humans and apes. As you may know, in the beginning of the 20th century, this test of copulation was actually uh, tried in um, Senegal, I think. So, why not try? Why wouldn't we do this test of copulations according to Blumenbach? And he says, well, there are these horrid stories of wanting of the union of men with brutes. We, of course, know them from mythology and so on. We never know of any instance related to good authority that any such connection being fruitful and has ever produced the horrid union of beast and man. So he has sort of an aesthetic and moral problem to actually do the experiment. So he thinks we cannot do this experiment. What else can we do? We can have the second sort of criteria. This is similarity. We can look at constancy of character. This is basically what, what paleoanthropologists do today. If they want here, you see a Neanderthal um, um, skull and a Homo sapiens skull. This is Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. So you, they say, well, these probably were um, um, two, two species or were not species. Now we have genetic methods, but for a long time we um, took this similarity, constancy of character. We can do this kind of discrimination because there are two kinds of differences. There is one because species have different origins and different uh, directions of the formative drive. Bildungstrief, if you have heard this from Bob Richards, we have major differences. And since varieties have the common origin, the formative drive can be modified, but we have minor differences. So it's a quantitative argument, basically. In the course of his argument, then, he goes through a lot of things. He, not only skulls, but he looks at everything he gets, basically. Uh, every trait he can find in humans and um, other um, animals he um, looks at. So he has, of course, things we know, erect position, pelvis, two hands, growth of teeth. And then there's an interesting point. Uh, he says, well, and there are additional criteria that differ humans from apes, but these belong only to women. So, women have the bosom, they have uh, menstruation, which uh, other animals don't, which is actually wrong. Bosom is actually right, this is wrong. And they have the human as a um, guarantee of virginity. You may uh, think this is a little sexist, but I think it's actually uh, the re reverse sexism because he says males are more uh, similar to um, apes than human females are to um, female apes. So you could make uh, Blumenbach's rule saying ape, man, female. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway. And then he goes on, mental faculties, he has only one st instinct, reason, speech, further characteristic, uh, um, helpless, he's a social animal, monogamy, he is um, not quite sure, and residence and diet are both unrestricted. I've just put in this picture to show this. It's extremely modern what he did. Yeah? This comparison of comparative studies of prosimians monkeys is from 2013 and human beings. This is just what biologists, uh, primatologists do today. Compared to these differences between the different species, he is comparing these between the varieties and then he finds other, other kind of minor differences. 
This is a lot of, I, I've um, told you that, he looks at basically everything he finds, color, a hair, iris of the eye, national face, form of the skull, teeth, ears, breasts, genitals. He's discussing, by, for example, the size of the penis, uh, differences, legs, feet, hands, variety for morbific affection, and so on. So, and in the end, he comes to the conclusion that these, all these minor differences can be traced back to um, degeneration based on climate food. This is basically uh, Buffon's argument, degeneration. So, <clears throat> if we look at Blumenbach's idea, you can clearly see this does not represent what he actually thinks, and this is the actual uh, illustration, and it shows not a hierarchical, but a uh, egalitarian um, um, ordering. But, <clears throat> and this is one of his arguments in the course of describing in this last part of the uh, different varieties, he uh, comes up with the point that the Caucasian variety from the Mount Caucasus produces the most beautiful race of, of man. We have heard this yesterday. And I wondered, um, I came just, I came up with this idea yesterday. The, the term most beautiful actually implies to me that the others are beautiful as well and one is just more beautiful and not that the others must be necessarily ugly. I mean, otherwise he would have said the only beautiful race of man, maybe. So just an idea we can discuss about. It seems to be the, uh, the original um, um, race of mankind. Why are they the most beautiful? He argues for that beautiful form primeval time, uh, uh, type, we have heard that, and then white in color, this is kind of interesting because he, from physiological reasons he thinks that the change from, from white to black is easier than from black to white. And he has, I think he has a fourth uh, unmentioned um, reason which seems to be so self-evident to the people of that time that he doesn't even mention it. it Otherwise, you would ask, why would the Caucasus be so important? And of course, we know from the creationists of our time, Noah's Ark landed at Mount Ararat. So this was the point from which all humans uh, migrated to the different um, um, continents. So I think he, uh, he, his idea is the people living there resemble the original humans because they did not migrate. And because they did not migrate, there was no change in environment and there was no degeneration. And this is probably what he also got from Buffon. You find it in Buffon a little bit. Every departure from the original form which was created by God was sort of kind of a, a, a degeneration, sort of a uh, uh, worsening. So I come to the conclusion. I think it's clear Blumbach was not a racist. He emphatically argued for the unity of mankind and he demonstrated the superficiality of the, uh, between the uh, human populations. But in a way, you could still ask with, with Gould, did he nevertheless promote racism somehow unintentionally? How was, he, how was the reception of Blumbach? Even if he said, one thing, could he be understood in a completely different thing? And I'm grateful to John uh, Michael to point um, out that this racist reading of Bloomberg actually existed. And he uh, gave, showed me this uh, table from Coleridge from 1836. He was, um, he actually writes Bloomberg's five races and he makes this triangle 1836. So, in a rather short time after Blumenbach uh, published this, this was sort of refigured, reshaped into this rather hierarchical, not by Blumenbach himself, but by people who somehow learned from him. But at the same time, we had an anti-racist reading of Blumenbach. This existed at the same time. Karl Heinrich, uh, Friedrich Heinrich Marx, who, who, who published an obituary of him, he said, when the Negroes and savages were still considered half animals, no one had yet conceived the uh, idea of emancipation of slaves. Blumbach raised his voice and showed their physical, uh, psychic, psychical qualities were not inferior to those of the Europeans and so on. 
In other countries, there was an, another, or there, we have more uh, sort of um, proofs for this. Um, for example, the French translation I found very interesting from 1804. He changed the title in the way I changed. So he got away from the variety and changed it to De l'unité du genre humain. I don't, I have not looked at the translation closer, but it seems very interesting to me that the French translator actually pointed out the, the main idea of Blumbach better than Blumbach himself had done that. And I think this is, we have heard this yesterday as well, this sort of sexual reading of Blumbach. I mean, if you look at those, at, at, the, at his pictures, they all have this sort of erotic connotation. His pictures of the races, all of them have this. Here you see is clearly as well. So you could say he's a, he's a, a forerunner of people like Gauguin, who have this interest in the foreign, in the attraction of what is different. So I want to end with this little picture from his book on the blue, on the Bildungstrieb. There you say, you say um, his picture of the Garden Eden with two snakes making love. And uh, with this picture, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>